All right, welcome to our first offensive line film review. I'm Max Dean here with Kyron Samuels. Kyron is our insider and offensive line expert. He played offensive line in Division I at Jacksonville State. Um, he also played in the AFL, earned all AFL honors. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the trenches. And so I feel very fortunate to have him help me break down some of the impending offensive linemen uh, in free agency this year. We're also going to look at some draft prospects on the offensive line coming up here, but we're kicking off the offseason and our first episode here, name pending, uh, to look at some free agents. So they might resign with their teams, they might go elsewhere, but either way, you can get a grasp on who is available to improve your O-line unit. And the first player that we're looking at today is Jawan Taylor. So first of all, Kyron, how you doing today, man? Doing pretty good, man. Excited to get this uh, O-line series rolling, man. It's always good to give the big guys some love and a little bit of attention, uh, especially in, in the media aspect. So really excited about that. For sure. I mean, it's something we've been talking about for a little while. Um, we started talking about it before the Senior Bowl and finally getting a chance to sit down and actually look at some of these guys. So, all right. We don't want to do crazy long deep dives. So we're going to kind of get into it here. The first player we're going to do is Jawan Taylor. He is the right tackle for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So he was uh, drafted a few years ago, played his full career with them. He was a high second round pick. Uh, so he basically started playing pretty quickly. I think one of the first things that I want to point out about Taylor is his availability. I believe he's played in every game so far, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think yeah, that he's missed out of 66 games. So yeah, availability is one of his best attributes for sure. No doubt about it. And we're going to look at the game coming up here uh, that the Jaguars won against the Chargers in the playoffs. Now, <laughs> it didn't offer a lot in the way of run game because they got down so quickly so early that they threw the ball a lot to catch up. But I also, at least based off of this game, felt like he was better in pass protection than as a run blocker anyway. So it's probably going to highlight some of his best features. Taylor is 6'5", about 3'12", so good size for a tackle. Drafted in the second round, 35th overall, by the Jacksonville Jaguars. So do you have anything that you want to highlight for Taylor before we actually start looking at the tape here? Yeah, for, for only being four years in, he's pretty advanced at, like, the very little, like, the intricate details and the nuances of offensive line play. Um, just for instance, you look here on the screen, look how deep he is compared to the center. He's, I mean, it's very, it's highly debatable. I remember this is a point of contention during the, the course of that game, um, if he was actually legal on a line of scrimmage <laughs> or not. But, I mean, those are the little things that separate you from being, like, you know, just good or from good to great or just from average to good. Little things like that. Like, people talk about Lane Johnson and is he jumping off sides all the time? Like, is he false starting? Like, those little details, like helping time snaps, um, do little things like that, or, or will help players uh, go from good to great. Even Trent Richardson, some of, like, the snatch stuff he does. A lot of people think those are holdings, and it's debatable. I mean, he does literally grab and snatch people down, but that's a part of the game. Those are those little details. Um, so to be only four years in, he's doing stuff that guys, like I just said, Lane Johnson, Trent uh, Williams – those guys have done and kind of created a technique um, that has lasted and kind of worked for them. So he's kind of figured a lot of that stuff out. Um, another thing that I really like about him is that he understands his like punch timing. A lot of people have long arms and don't use them properly. He's one of the few guys that really does. And I really enjoy watching him in his passes, particularly because he likes to get his hands on. He will show you multiple uh, flashes with his hands. He'll outside stab you one time. He'll inside stab you the other time. He'll double hand you reset. I mean, he just does a lot of high level stuff. And I think he's only getting better. 25 years old. He's played in every – he started every game he's played in. He's always available. Um, and he's only getting better. I think that's the biggest thing here, especially for a free agent testing the market right now. Uh, he's going to have a lot of value because there's a ton of teams over the NFL that need a tackle, right tackle specifically. Um, we could just look at the AFC West team, the, the NFC East team, excuse me, the AFC East teams. Even some NFC East teams uh, could possibly need a tackle here going forward. Um, the commanders are a team that might be in the tackle market. Um, the Cowboys could always upgrade. You know, they have a revolving door um, of offensive linemen there. We don't know who's going to come back, how it's going to work out with them. So he, he's going to have a very, very high value in this market coming up. 
Mm -hmm. And again, I haven't watched every single game of his throughout the season. Right. Far from it. But I will say that I would be interested in him going to a team more like the Chiefs than a team probably like the Eagles, where they are run or uh, throwing the ball a lot more than running the ball. Mm -hmm. um, just because, again, small sample size, but I felt like there was a notable difference in terms of what he was able to do in pass protection versus run blocking. So if you're a team that does run the ball a heavy, heavy amount, if you're a team like the Jets, you're a team like the 49ers, if you're I'm not sure how much of a you know difference there would be in price for him and McGlinchy anyway, so it's probably not, you know, the place right. where he'd be going. But at least at least in that terms of that type of offense, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you he's the guy that you'd be looking for. But so what I've tried to do here is put together a few different clips where he is handling outside moves and inside moves and uh, power like bull rush type moves so that you can kind of see how he handles each one of those. Um, and then I also have a couple of the plays where they ended up being interceptions um, because it was either a blitz and he was involved or there was some kind of stunt type of uh, situation where he had to basically recognize that. And then you can reflect on how he handled all of that. And then the run plays are going to be at the end. So just starting off here, um, He's always going to be at right tackle, but you just tell me what you see. Um, yeah, we can roll that back a little bit. I can, but also we can watch it from the other side, gotcha. which might make it a little bit easier here. Yeah, so kind of stop here for me. Um, first of all, it's like really important to just identify fronts here. We got a basic four man front. You got two linebackers in the box. Um, the running backs already identified his guy, so they're always going to have that uh, responsibility first. I think people just need to understand that. When we talk about offensive line play, uh, normally it's the center that's going to communicate all that stuff, but everybody has to be on the same page for these things to work. Um, and so basically identifying the four man front, he's going to have the outside guy almost 10 times out of 10, right? There's only, there's going to be very few things that ever change that responsibility. Um, so knowing that it should change the way you pass it. It should change the way you, uh, you know, change up your punches. It should change the way you have your feet aligned. Everything changes based off of that notion right there. So you see, he has a wide nine. We would consider this a wide nine, um, which means the guy is way outside of line. So based off of that already, uh, there's a lot of things that could go wrong here. First of all, you can't overset. What is oversetting mean? Oversetting means overextending, kicking out wide uh, to try to accommodate for the space gap. Uh, those things are that can get you in trouble because it opens up the inside. As soon as you try to overcompensate, jumping outside, oversetting, um, then you get beat underneath. You get beat across the face. And that's the easiest path to a quarterback. It's getting beat across the face um, and giving them a, a straight shot. So little things like that, just knowing it um, and being disciplined in your sets, being disciplined in your time and being disciplined um, in your technique is what's going to carry you over. So uh, you go ahead, roll it here. So I really like how much balance he has here, especially because it gets kind of muddy right there. And he manages to keep his feet uh, quite effectively. Right. Um, so you want me to roll it one more time? Yeah, one more time. Um, but just so I can like, so look, he's, he's staying square, right? A lot of people jump out. Like I said, they overset, they get back um, in that, in that frantic mindset. Cause oh, we got to, why not? We got to just jump out there. He does a very good job of staying disciplined, staying in this technique. And he does a really good job of keeping his inside hand strong. strong. If you can run it back one more time, we can see the punch. He initially strikes with the outside arm, but the inside arm is where you can get beat, right? What I just talked about getting beat across the face. He does a great job of outside striking so he strikes with the outside and then he keeps the inside strong because that's where his weakness is at that point um but he does a great job of keeping that inside hand strong and then anchoring at this point you have both hands on him um you have your body in front of his body it's about anchoring and keeping him from collapsing the pocket um so he does a great job here of one taking the set being disciplined in the set two uh, working with his hands he uses both hands outside strike inside strike strong and then he settles and then he anchors which gives him um, a great rep. If I'm an offensive line coach and I'm grading a rep against another NFL player, this is what I want it to look like every time. It's not going to always look pretty. It's not always going to look dominant. This is what it looks like. This is a win 10 times out of 10 in the NFL. You run your guy by the quarterback. He has a nice pocket to throw the ball from. Mm -hmm. I love that he gets hit by his guard on the left side while he's in protection and he doesn't stumble. He doesn't fall down. Like he doesn't he doesn't lose his balance right. in any way. He just like finishes the rep. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to highlight it there. Um, because not every rep is going to be clean. You're going to have guys up in your yep. grill from any which direction. All right, yeah. next up, 
All right, go ahead. No, I'm saying balance. If I'm looking for like evaluating a college guy, or I'm evaluating an NFL guy, seeing how much um, money, like how much we project him to get paid, is he a Pro Bowl or Pro level? Balance is always one of the first things I look for. Um, Because this this, is the short answer to give you the bigger picture. Because if you're Mm -hmm. always in balance, you're always in position. That means you're doing the little technique things, right? That means you're identifying Mm -hmm. things. You're not over overthinking. Uh, That means you're taking the proper sets. That means you have proper hand placement and punch. Um, All those things matter to keep you balanced. Uh, If you're in a great position to block, nine times out of ten, you're going to win that block. So uh, balance is incredibly key. So I'm glad you brought that up because that is the most important thing um, that I look for when I'm looking at offensive line play. Mm, it's something you're going to see consistently throughout his tape. All right, we can watch this one and go back. Yeah, I mean, it's just this is just this is what it looks like. This is a prototype real football reps here. You're getting a, a crazy speed rush. You got this wide nine again. I mean, this isn't just anybody. This is, I believe, that's uh, Joey Bosa. Joey Bosa. Like, this isn't just anybody, right? This is all pro, one of the best, you know, one of the five or six best pass rushers in the NFL. Um, so like I said, the first rep, it'll be very easy to overcompensate, to, to freak out in your mind and speed up the process, right? You got Joey Bosa out there. He's in the why not. You're scared of what he can do getting up the field. And you can go ahead and let it roll. He can say, great get off here, Joey Bosa. Um, but instead of jumping out, oversetting, overcompensating, he stays disciplined. Boom. Gets his hands on, strikes with both hands, and then he survives the rep. That's a realistic rep. That's what it's supposed to look like when you're going up against an all pro. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a great rep. Uh, the same discipline that he carried over from the first rep, the set looks the same. The only thing that was different was he got both hands on, which I think is smart against a guy like Joey Bosa. Um, the elite guys, you don't want to give him uh, a surface. When you punch with one hand, that means the other surface, the other half of your body is exposed. And a guy like that at that skill level uh, could potentially take advantage of a, of a situation like that. So I think two-hand striking, getting both hands on, and then really using all of your power is by far the best way to go against elite pass rushers like that. Yeah, in the first play, uh, the interior tried to loop around, um, but because his he locked up the end so well, it didn't really happen. And this one, he's got more space to work with, so he just carries Bosa right around the pocket, which is nice. And even though the play isn't a win for the offense, it's definitely a win for Taylor here. All right. <clears throat> so next up, I think we have a power mover, at least a bull rush, if I remember correctly. Yeah. One thing I'm just noticing, like going over here, it's very, very difficult and very, very hard for guys to be consistent with their sets, especially going up against multiple people. Right. Um, You're not just going against anybody. You're going up against the best. This is a playoff game. This is uh, for all the marbles. I think that's Kyle Van Noy, uh, a Mm -hmm. veteran that has been through the ringer a million times. That has all the moves, has everything you will look for. His sets look the same as they did the first rep. They look the same as they did against Joey Bosa. To me, that is that level of consistency um, that you will crave for if you're an offensive line coach. Um, I'm watching these things. I'm looking for that balance. He's balanced. He's poised. He's on time. He's never jumping out. He's never off kilter. So he's one half of the battle before we even get to the the punch, before we even get to the, the surviving part, the really gritting grind where you have to fight through the blocks to win the blocks. He's one half the battle. So this is the first thing I'm noticing when I'm looking at him. His sets are perfect, and they are timed right every time. Um, but just getting to the bull rush, he keeps his inside hand strong. Um, Kyle Van Noy, is, is, it's a bull rush, but he's trying to take half a man. He's trying to get on that sneaky shoulder um, and, and get that half a man because it's a softer shoulder, right? You're sitting out. He's on the right side. He's probably right-hand dominant. Um, that inside shoulder is going to be the one that you can take advantage of a lot easier. Um, Kyle Van is trying to fight through there, but his inside hand is so strong, and a lot of that is because of the balance, right? What we talked about with the set, look where his feet are. Um, his his post foot, which is his inside foot, is high, which allows him to keep that hand in there and strong. Um, if mm-hmm. that post foot was back, if he was off balance, if his feet were even on the same playing field, it would be extremely easy for Kyle Vanoy to take that um, sneaky shoulder and get on the inside because you don't have power when your feet are s- stuck together. Um, so yeah. that goes back to the set. Yeah, I was just going to comment. I, I love his feet in this because he keeps that foot forward and then – and his legs are spaced nicely until the actual contact is made. And then he drops the the leg back to anchor. You know what I mean? Like, so he doesn't widen too quickly because, and, and lose that leverage. Again, it's just balance that you see throughout. All right, yeah, and again. Uh, I, I love him. I, I, the more I look at him, um, <laughs> the more I think about, like, how rare it is in this 
NFL right now. Like this is almost <laughs> Walker Little was the swing tackle, right? But I think if I'm the Jacksonville Jaguars, if we're just talking, you know, free agency here, you know, I do everything I can to bring this guy back. 25 years old, um, extremely consistent, extremely durable. Uh, these are the type of people that you should that aren't going to be as uh, popular of names. I think people will, will kind of start to get a little bit uh, more of a sense of how good this guy is. Uh, but right now, I don't think the the general population understands how valuable a guy like this is. Mm -hmm. You're never going to hear about a guy like this. He plays for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's the right tackle. Uh, it's not the glamour position. Uh, but the value, the, the actual worth of this guy uh, is as high as anybody on that field. <laughs> you, need a, you need a tackle like this, especially in the AFC uh, when you're going against some of these crazy pass rushers. I mean, you got Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, uh, and Calvin Noy just on this team. You have to have a guy like this. So I'm really excited to see people kind of get a glimpse of how good this guy is. Mm -hmm. So here's another one where Bosa, he's matched up again, and he takes it. He tries to take the inside. So it's something we haven't seen yet. Um, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about not oversetting, not that he rushes hard outside, but well, yeah. Can we go back a little bit to the beginning, just so priest now we can see how this should change your your process, your thought process about it a little bit. So mm. already you see it's coming up. So I mean they've been playing basic four man front with two linebackers in in the box. Already you see something's different. You got two guys walk up to the line of scrimmage. Um, you know I'm I'm kind of glad that you didn't get like a full slide or you didn't get anything of that sort. They communicated well. Uh, they know where they're going to go, and it gives him a chance. So listen, so you see how he's like getting his feet ready. He knows what he has to do. He's still taking his set. His set looks the same, uh, but he's prepared for the inside move because look where his inside leg is. I mean, the same thing we talked about last time, which is great. We should be having the same conversations a little bit because that means you're doing the consistent work. That means you're doing uh, – you're trusting your technique and you're relying um, on the things that got you there. So he is prepared for this inside move because his set looks the same, because his feet are in the right place, because his hands are in the right place, and he recognizes the stun off the rip. Um, so look, I mean, he doesn't jump out. Boom. He sees it, washes it down. I mean, it's just, uh, it, at this point, I know some people like are nitpicking like, Oh, he dropped his inside, he dropped his post foot. Well, they're not passing off a, a stunt here. I mean, he has this guy, this is his man. At this point, the only objective is to wash him down the line of scrimmage and his technique allows him to do so. All right. At this point, the Jags are finally kind of moving on offense a little bit. So I think yeah. this is the last. This is the last pass pro set before we get to a couple of the interceptions, and this one is the spin move. So it's, again, it's just one more uh, rep versus a variety of different moves. Okay. Get that from the yeah, there we go. So Sorry again, I mean, yeah, pause. I mean, identifying, I mean, the same look. I mean, you're in the red zone, you, you're pretty much um, I mean, you got three wide receivers on the field. You're not expecting too much uh of a crazy blitz package or anything pressure wise here in the red zone. Um, especially when I mean you have ETN, but he's not a power back by any means. You're expecting them to kind of throw the ball a little bit around here. I mean, they've had success with it earlier in the game and now they're rolling so. Pre-snap, you don't see anything too crazy. You see, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of a little bit wider. I mean, he's the guy's in the three technique, but you could almost call that a four-eye. Um, mm -hmm. So you could probably look at that a little bit and think that, hey, they, he might be a little wider. Maybe I could get a twist here. Maybe I could get a stunt here. Uh, but other than that, I mean, nothing too crazy where your antennas are going off. So uh, it's not going to change anything set-wise. So I think he's smart enough to identify that and realize that off the rip. But then you can go ahead and let it roll. Yeah, I think also you want to be aware of an inside move because right. when you're in the red zone, you need to get there quickly as a defender because everything just happens so much faster. Let me go back one more time. Um, so, again, good awareness. But yeah, I mean, the thing that I've just really come to love about this, guys, it looks the same, man. Look at Tommy. Uh, go, go back two seconds, please. Watch how fast he is out of his stance. Before Bosa even gets out of his stance, he has his second foot down already. I mean, that, that that's those are the things that will allow you to boom. He sees it already. He's already two feet down. Um, his hands could be a little higher, but, I mean, he's very great at timing his punch. His feet are already set. He's already in perfect position to defend whatever is getting ready to come here. If he goes up the field, tries to give you an up-the-field rush, boom, he's already in good position. His post foot's high. If he tries to go across the face, 
he's in great position to defend that. Um, so I think that uh, his consistency with his set is something to be desired, especially at 25 years old. I don't think people understand how like rare this is, that at 25 years old, you're this consistent, um, you have this ability, you have this uh, body type, because a lot of people have the consistent sets, um, they have the consistent you know, technique, but their body doesn't allow for them to be a, a tackle in this league. Uh, but he's mm-hmm. six foot five, 315 pounds. Uh, his frame and his arm length allows for him um, to use those things to his advantage. And that's why he's a great player in this league right now. Yeah. And I think even in this position where he is right now, a lesser athlete at the tackle position could still definitely lose this rep against the spin move. So further speaks to the you know core strength and balance here. Right. And this athleticism, like, he has his fit, his foot in the air, which is the last place you ever want to be as an offensive lineman. But he gets it down so fast, and he gets it. Uh, he gets some washed down line of scrimmage. That goes back to that just technique, right? Like his post foot's high. If his post foot was back, and then he has his leg in the air, his body's completely turned to the quarterback. It's a totally different rep. Um, so because he was able to be consistent in this set and have his feet where they were supposed to be, uh, is why he was able to recover and wash that down the line of scrimmage. Mm-hmm. All right, so. I love the end zone copy. So yeah, I'm looking here. Nothing too crazy alignment wise again. I mean, you're getting the same stuff that you'll be getting all night. Yeah. So he's against Khalil Mack here, or hypothetically, but then there's a blitz that comes through the um uh the B gap. Yeah. And so my question is, is that his responsibility? Because not always, but generally you're supposed to protect the fastest route to the quarterback. And he looks like he kind of glances there. He puts his arm out, but the space is already kind of created. So should he be coming back inside to try and take him out? Or should he just well, let, let... It's empty here. So you, you don't have a back. So they have probably communicated this from the beginning. Um, it's 3-4 here. You, you, you have the center covered, and then both of your tackles are covered here. So you got a three-man front. Um, typically, you're going to see man-on-man there, and you're going to see... Um, the, te- the guards just help wherever they're needed and look for spillers, look for the guards are going to have, however they've identified this during the week, one of those linebackers are the offensive linemen. Um, so they're going to be responsible for those down, uh, one of the linebackers, and something off of the edge. So he's the edge guy here for sure. So he is doing his job. He's where he's supposed to be. Um, you know, the guy comes inside, which is where that's what the guard is there for, Kyle Vannoy, that is. He comes inside, that's where the guard there is for. He's looking outside because there has to be something to replace what just came. So he's doing his job here, especially against this defense in this front here. All right. So you're basically, you just you just need Trevor Lawrence not to throw that interception. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, the guy, the guy. So the guy outside is the one that Juwan Juwan Taylor is responsible for uh, okay. because you don't have enough to block. I mean, that's when you go empty, quarterback has to know who's the hot. The DB is the hot. I mean, you're not going to come off the down the guy on the line of scrimmage. Uh, to block that DB. I mean, just I mean, we're just thinking here, you'd rather have, uh, I think that was Asante Samuel Jr. You'd rather have him running after <laughs> uh, Trevor Lawrence with a free reign <laughs> than Khalil Mack. So take those guys, be responsible for those guys, and then he has to know where his hot is, who who is the yeah. guy that he's coming. I think Samuel made the pick, and 23 was the blitzer. I forget who that is. Yeah. yeah. So um, I mean, who, whoever the DB was, like – the, nine times out of ten, that'll be the quarterback's responsibility. He has to know mm-hmm. that's the hot guy. So where I think he, and you know, I mean, he threw it to that side, so he did know that that was the hot. But it's just a throw that you probably shouldn't make. Throw that ball away, live to fight another down, or check. I mean, check it down if you can. But there was no back there. All right, so I'm gonna let you watch this again, and then we'll see it from the end zone. Okay. All right, we got the we got the wide nine again. I mean, these are things that um, you got a four man front again here. So we got a, we got a three man front last time. Back to the four man front, and you have you know Kyle Noy walk down. Um, those things should probably let you know, hey, something could be coming. Uh, you got one linebacker in the box. I mean, we don't know. Uh, this is a look that you haven't seen in the previous clips that we've shown. So maybe he's looking at something pre snap and like, hey, my antenna is going off a little bit, but. Your primary responsibility is Joey Bosa in a wide nine. So nothing mm-hmm. different should be um, had with the set here. 
just take the same set, just have that recognition, be, be strong on the inside. And that's where it comes. So we get a little TE or ET game here. Uh, we get the, the inside guy trying to pick off the tackle and confuse the guard and give Joy Bosa an inside reign right here. And they do a great job of passing it off. I mean, yeah, you got one of the best in the business right there playing with you. So passing that mm -hmm. off and the recognition, right? You see how high his post foot is? Uh, Jawan Taylor, his big white shoe right there. Look how high. That is great. He's fighting through the inside of that block, though. That's what it should look like because you don't want to give him, you know, if your feet are stationed there, your feet there, you kind of have an easier pass to the quarterback. He has to fight through that body. So that's what you're taught as an offensive lineman. You know, fight through hard, keep that post foot up, and then wash it down, which I think they do a really good job here of passing off this twist. Some of these are just super, super difficult on Trevor Lawrence. It's like, I see what he sees, but <clears> – <throat> You know, don't be a hero, man. I mean, we saw what it looked like in the second half uh, when he mm -hmm. kind of settled down a little bit. I don't think the blocking mm -hmm. was uh, any, you know, significantly better in the second half than it was in the first half. These are just little decisions that he made that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, you saw him grow up in real time, essentially. I think that was a, one of the coolest things about that game was seeing him kind of progress. But, I mean, that's just beautiful. This is just, you know, downhill stuff. You're getting him in a, a down block here. Get the... So, I mean, hey, we got the same stuff you've been getting all, all day. Four men front, boom. You got a down block. It's coming off power. You're going back to the linebacker here. So their objective is to take the down lineman to the linebacker. And he sees it late and tries to come off. But the most important thing is moving um, the down guy. If you're an offensive line coach, wherever, the whole objective is to take the down lineman to the linebacker so you don't have to worry about passing it off. Um, and they do a pretty good job of that here. I mean, I think they they take him, what, six yards down the field. I mean, they do a really good job of getting movement on that guy. Um, and he, he probably should see it a little bit earlier. So, boom, he should be coming off here. Mm -hmm. uh, and he should be coming off there. But when you take him the down lineman that far, you're always going to have success there. And, and I think that was a really good rep from him. You can fix stuff like that. Um, a lot of times when in these run reps, effort is the biggest thing. Right. Catch that, or you want me to hit it again? No, no, good. I, I just prefer the, <laughs> I prefer the the tight copies. But yeah, we just got a regular old wide zone here. I mean, you get him; he takes his step. I think he. The cool thing about him, a guy at that size, is how much ground he covers. You see how difficult it is in the passing game to stay consistent, say, uh, to say vertical and not jump out there. But in in these type of situations where you have to be more downhill, a little bit more aggressive, um, the fact that he is so long and rangy uh, allows for him to cover ground. Uh, and, and something that would take other guys two or three steps to get there, he closes the gap in one step. So he closes the gap, he gets his hands on, and he runs them through. I mean, this is what it's supposed to look like if you can't reach him. If you're just getting, getting the wide zone, he's that far out, you're probably not going to reach him. He's a, he's a great athlete. But just getting a body on a body and allowing for, the, uh, for your running back to make a cut, that's what it's all about right there. And he does a hell of a job, and that's a good rep. All right. So I tried to pull what I could for the run game. Um that's all I got for you today. Uh, we went for about 30 minutes, which is longer than we expected. Perhaps we yeah. should plan on these being more long form conversations anyway. Um, and, you know, I think the only thing that I would point out uh, is that he, from what I saw, I didn't see a nasty finisher in the run game. It just doesn't necessarily like suit his personality. It's just not really what he does. Um, but like you saw, he can be effective in a variety of, you know, different schemes. But I think that if you're going to maximize what he brings to the table, it's definitely a pass first offense. Um, anything else that you just want to close out with? Cause we're, we're nearing up on 30 minutes here. So. I mean, no, I think that was a good first run. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Just getting to be able to talk about uh, a little bit of offensive line play. And I hadn't watched a ton of Jawan Taylor specifically. So it was good for me to be able to see some of the stuff and what makes him go, because I I've always, uh, heard you know how consistent he was and when i'm watching he he looks like a really good player um but really get down to break it down and see how consistent his set is see how uh, versatile he is with his punches and his hand strikes is very impressive so i already thought it was like, a really good market for him but uh, if teams are watching the same thing we're watching and it's going to be <laughs> a bidding war for this guy so he he should be happy he's getting ready to get paid yeah he's in a small market so people aren't necessarily aware of what he's done um and who he's become as a player but 
inevitably what's going to happen is he's going to sign a deal for probably well over $10 million a year. And then all of a sudden he's going to be not a household name, but a name that, you know, more NFL fans are aware of. Sometimes you just need that free agency uh, coverage to become a player that suddenly people are aware of. And suddenly people are talking about in terms of pro bowl um, bids and, and whatnot, but all right, Kyron, it's been fun. I appreciate you doing this with me and we're definitely going to do it more. We're going to try and go a little bit. I'm fine with doing some longer form versions. If we're going to hit 30 minutes for some of these offensive line ones for the prospect ones, we'll probably keep it a little bit tighter just because there's going to be, we're going to try and get so through so many of those guys and keep it consistent. But if we're going to talk about offensive line for a half an hour, every couple of days, man, I'm good with that. But you can find me at the Max Dean. You can find Kyron at Kyron Samuels. You can find Defiant Takes Football at Defiant Takes on all social media platforms. Um, we will be back, Nick and I, this Thursday with Quincy Carrier to talk about the uh, AFC North offseason preview and talk about some quarterbacks and the draft. But there's a ton of content coming your way. So just check out DefiantTakesFootball.com sure. and the Defiant Takes Football YouTube channel or podcast uh, feed and you can find it all. All right, man. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it.